you come too if you want. Hello, everybody. We are live broadcasting to you from the Nelson studio. I'm Rob Nelson. I'm an ecologist. I study animals. I also have over here, we have Leo and August who are joining me today to make sure that I will be talking about, oh, and my wife, Haley. We all do science communication. We are talking to you today about what I think is the most calming thing to talk about in the world right now. And that is the worst nuclear disaster that has ever happened yeah. on the history of this planet. Trust me, it's going to be fantastic. Okay, you guys sit in the audience. On, they're they're going to oh, make yeah. sure I, I bring it down no. to the level of kids because we've been having a lot of fun. <laughs> I have props. Could you shut the door for me too? And we're, we're going to get right into this uh, in just three, two, one. And we're going to start this thing with a bang because that's what happened in Chernobyl. <laughs> but I will get to that in a second. Oh, much better. All the way shut, please. <clears throat> so here's what we're going to do. Um, I'm going to introduce myself a little bit. I'm going to talk about some of my history. We're going to talk about the history of Chernobyl, this event that happened that was really bad. And then we're going to think about how can we think about the future by thinking about these past historical events. And it's going to be really fun. Um, and so I think I'm going to just start out by introducing who I am because I draw a lot of things. I, I am constantly drawing to tell stories and, um, you know, why, why don't I just use a little drawing to, to start that? Now, I'm not going to start it as a kid. That's how everybody starts it. I'm going to start when I was 19 years old, and I decided I wanted to be a marine biologist. So I went to Australia. That's where I met my buddy, Jonas, my best friend. And we sat in the audience of this giant theater, and we watched this presentation about the Great Barrier Reef. And we we're like, that is amazing. We want to study the Great Barrier Reef, and we want to make films about it. And so I went down to the guy, and I said, how do you do that? That sounds cool. And he said, all you have to do is take a video camera and start telling every story you possibly can. So fast forward a few years to 2003. That seems so long ago. <laughs> and that's exactly what I did. I decided I would go all in into being a marine biologist and buying a really nice video camera and telling stories. So I bought six plane tickets for my buddies, a 1976 Chevy van that was $150. And we traveled 7,000 miles through Mexico, but in a van that had no air conditioning or seats. So we had the door completely open because it was so hot. And in the end, we made an amazing documentary called The Biodiversity of Mexico. And it was a lot of energy and effort. And I was kind of broke and poor. So I decided I would buy a sailboat and live on it offshore in Hawaii as I was doing my research. And that's when things started to change for my life. And it wasn't what I thought at the time, a change for the better. I took my sailboat and I decided to sail out one day and they didn't check the weather. So I sailed into the storm of the decade. That little boat right there got flipped end over end, smashed to pieces. I was swimming out in the ocean. I grabbed the last buoy out to sea, sea several miles offshore from Hawaii. I got rescued by the Coast Guard. I nearly died. And I thought to myself, this is the worst it can possibly get. I lost my research that day. I lost everything I owned, my scuba gear, my clothes. <laughs> and I thought to myself, uh, how am I ever going to get through this? So for about a month, I had to stop and think about what is really important to me. I had to just kind of come back from my life at that moment, which was all about school and getting grades and, and trying to beat the next person in the class. And it was a great perspective for me because I decided I am going to now use my video camera and I'm going to learn about things in this world and communicate them to everyone else. So that's more or less the gist of my story. And that's how I became uh, what I'm doing right now, which is both a marine biologist and a storyteller uh, and trying to do science communication like in presentations just like this. So I've had now the unique ability to travel to a lot of different places around the world um, and look at things that seem really bad and actually are and then try to figure out how things have changed moving into the future. For, for example, I went to this giant volcano that exploded, Pompeii, and it covered an entire town. And I looked to see what happened. And I looked at uh, historical figures like Blackbeard the Pirate. What happened to him and, and all of his treasure? Uh, I looked at Hitler. I looked at King Solomon. I even looked at a snake that literally ate somebody. So I'm looking at all of these seemingly terrible events. <laughs> 
and then trying to figure out what's happened to them. And that's why we're talking about how to look into the future. Now, one of my most memorable expeditions was a trip that I took to Chernobyl. Now, I know a lot of you probably will know what Chernobyl is, especially if you're my age. But if you're not my age, maybe you don't know what Chernobyl is. And so I am going to um, fill you in as if you have no idea what this this whole thing is that we call Chernobyl. Essentially, it was the worst nuclear accident in the history of mankind. So take uh, the Hiroshima bomb, like hundreds of times worse than that, spewing out radiation into, into the world. Okay, so this all happened when I was six years old in 1986. Now imagine you were a six-year-old in the town right next to this power plant. That happened to be in Ukraine, which used to be the old Soviet Union. And you're sitting with your family. And then all of a sudden you hear this bang. And you look out the window and it's nighttime. And there's this ball of flame shooting into the air where the power plant was, the big nuclear power plant. And you don't know what's happening. Nobody else knows what's happening. You think you're safe though, right? Because you can't see it. You can't smell it. You can't feel it. But it's radiation now emitted from that nuclear disaster to you. So... Now, it took a little bit of time, but a few days, well, it, it was a little bit of time afterwards, they called the alarm and everybody evacuated. So the scientists basically said, hey, this is really bad. We have to listen uh, to what's happening here and get everybody out. So they took all the kids, they took all the moms, they took a lot of the dads, um, and then they decided they've got to clean this whole place up. So th this is where we're talking. You know, I know this doesn't mean a lot to a lot of people, but this is Ukraine up in the north. So they brought in afterwards 50,000 people to clean it up that were called liquidators. And so they took a lot of the ionizing radiation, a lot of the radioactive particles, and they, they scooped it off of the surface of the ground, sprayed it off of the cement, and cleaned this whole area up. So that was really a good thing that happened, even though there was this really bad disaster. Now, that more or less just sets the stage of what happened. Hopefully, you can picture this event in your head. And by the way, start leaving questions down here because I will get to them at the end. Now, what we did is we made a little story uh, called The Life After Chernobyl. We were one of the first film crews in there given full exclusive access to the entire exclusion zone to try to figure out what is happening to the plants and animals there because that's what I do. I'm a biologist. So for me... I went in equipped more or less like this. I had a little personal disseminer, disseminer on my chest and a Geiger counter, which measures the radiation coming to you. Now, I took a little notebook like this to help me interview the scientists, figure out what was going on. Um, by the way, if you recognize this symbol, this is a symbol for ionizing radiation, stay away. That, that's what is on nuclear power plants. And in, to be honest with you, that's probably the symbol that should have been on the thumbnail to this video. The other one is a biohazard symbol. I think that's the graphics people's problem. I don't know. Graphics. People. I am the <laughs> graphics people. That was just a mistake. <laughs> so a couple of fun facts. I, when I was taking this book here in, I was able to do a couple of things like collect a couple of samples. These are radioactive uh, leaves from an aspen tree. Um, I was looking for wolves, so I was able to figure out in Russian, how do you say, where are the wolves? Have you seen any? So if any of you are Russian, you can correct me if I'm wrong here, but it's Vividel Volki. Can you guys say that? Vividel Volki. Yeah, a Volki or a Volk is a wolf in Russian, so that's a fun little tidbit. Now, one of the other neat things that I discovered while I was there is this plant. Now this is a unique plant because this is an absinthe plant, um, or sorry, an artemisia plant, which is where absinthe comes from and it grows all over the region. We call it wormwood, but in that region, in the local dialect, they call it Chernobyl. So it's just kind of a fun, interesting tidbit. The whole town was originally named after these plants. Then they named the power plant after it. Then it exploded and uh, and then was a really bad thing. But if you're an ecologist or a biologist like myself, you can find all of these interesting tidbits. Uh, very fascinating because you're learning about the plants and animals. Yes, quick question over there in the audience. I heard of Chernobyl. You heard of Chernobyl. Great. If you've also heard of Chernobyl, let me know in the comments or if you haven't. Questions at the end. We will get to all of them. We will get to all of them at the end.
We have a live studio audience here today, which is fantastic. Um, <laughs> Um, uh, good question, though. Uh, how dangerous is it to visit right now, you ask, James? Uh, it is somewhat dangerous, but it's all relative. So I was, for instance, able to go into the exclusion zone, stand 50 yards from uh, the reactor number four, which is the one that exploded, and look at it. And I was getting just a little bit of radiation, five microsieverts, and we don't need to get into all the technical bits, but it's just a little bit more than you would have if you're in an airplane flying at altitude. So that's pretty amazing. And the people we have to thank for that are all the liquidators that went in to clean it up. Now, what I did, what I think was, is should be most interesting, let's get back to the wildlife, right? Because I, I study uh, plants and animals. The big question was, what is happening to the wildlife? We know radiation is bad for humans, but was it bad for the plants and animals there? In particular, I was looking for the volki, the wolves. And so I wanted to know, are they more dangerous? So maybe in the comment section here, you can tell me what you think. And don't Google it, because I will tell you now, if you Google it, you're going to be wrong, because they don't have that information out there. That's one thing we discovered, and I'll get to that in the end. But first, when you enter this park, or the exclusion zone, there's two big checkpoints. At 30 kilometers from ground zero, you have to go through military checkpoints, and at 10 kilometers, another checkpoint. And only certain people are allowed into those different places. But as soon as you pass those military checkpoints, which are like, well, you feel like you're in, in the Soviet Union and in Russia, and it's like back in the Cold War, you're looking out at grassy fields and plains and forests. Could you get the dog? And it feels like a national park, like you can't see any impact of humans at all. It's this amazing thing. <laughs> and uh, so that I think was the thing that struck me the most was just how wild it actually looked. And when you start looking at what plants and animals are there, there's so many animals say that have come back. So you have wolves and brown bears and lynx and foxes and otters. Uh, you've got rare Chevalsky horses, which have been making a comeback. Um, moose, deer, I mean, you name it. Anything that should have been there probably found its way back and is doing really well. And that's a remarkable thing. Now, there's also a lot of birds that have found their way back to Chernobyl. Uh, oh, I did want to I did want to show you this little cute fox. This is a cute fox that we found in the exclusion zone uh, in the old city of Prupyat. So if you were a kid and that's where you lived, he's running around your old stomping grounds. And this little fox we call Simone. And uh, uh, well, I don't know if it was a boy or a girl, but pretty cute little fox. <laughs> One of the things that is interesting is we were studying the birds. So here's a little drawing I made. There's birds. You've got this radiation on the ground. So they're stepping on radiation. And then you have radiation that's coming up out of the ground, these radioactive particles being sucked into the leaves and the fruits. And then they eat the fruits. So we wanted to know what's happening to them. And here's the weird thing. Some of the birds not doing as well. Some of the birds definitely having more rates of tumors, cataracts, that's stuff that happens with your eyes, and uh, losing color in their, in their feathers and a lot of albinism, so that's turning white. But, oh, oh, and 5% smaller brains. That's not very good. You don't want your brain to get any smaller. But what we found is that 16 species of birds are actually doing better inside of the zone. And that was like poof, mind blown because how is that even possible? <laughs> For instance, there's one bird there called the great tit, which is actually the name. And it was a, um, an interesting bird in that it produces these compounds in its body that help make antioxidants, which fight the free radicals, which then basically fight this, all this radiation. Wow. That was a lot of science there. Essentially the point is they're adapting to the situation and they're actually doing better. Now let's get to the wolves. My whole point was to go there and look at the wolves. This is a picture of the wolves from the documentary. And what we found is that even though the rumors are that radiation causes these mutations and aggressive wolves, we found that wasn't the case at all. There was no increase in aggression all we found was that the wolves were increasing in number. They're doing seven times better inside of the Chernobyl exclusion zone than they are outside. So 
here is kind of the big take home for me, which I think was just so encouraging, is that if you give nature a chance, despite terrible circumstances, nature will find a way. And I think that's so fantastic because it means even if something bad happens, there's a lot of good that can come from it. Um, and, and from a nature perspective, if we just pull ourselves out and we stop hunting the wolves and hunting the deer and doing all of these things that would make them not very abundant, even though there's these, this radiation, they'll do pretty well. Now, obviously, I should note, it's not like radiation is good, but having us pulled away is even better for these animals. Now, I want to bring this back to today. What, what does this really mean? Well, here you have this historical event of Chernobyl and, you know, maybe my historical event of sinking the ship. Two bad things that happened. And I can look back now and see the silver lining in both of those events. Um in Chernobyl, like I just talked about, and, and with my sailboat, it changed the course of my life, and I would never change that. Uh, it, it allowed me to do all of the things that I'm doing today because I st had the time to breathe, step back, think about what is really important. And today, we're in a unique situation. Apparently, I can't say the name of the particular virus that we are being afflicted by because YouTube will somehow block the video. <laughs> so I'm just going to show this picture. We all know what's going on. A lot of you are sitting at home trying to think, what is happening? Is this the end of the world? Well, it's not because... You know, I was at a couple of things where I thought was the end of the world, and a lot of good things actually did happen from it. Um, but I want to give you a few different tips on how to think about things moving into the future that will be healthy for your mind, your body, and your soul. Now, the first thing is that, and you can write this down if you want, the first tip, don't worry, because what's there to worry about? Uh, everything is happening as it's happening in the world. And there are people that are tasked to try to solve this problem. And especially if you're a kid at home, uh, you should know that people out there have spent their whole life studying stuff like this and are on the job trying to get it done. Okay, I understand that there's this inclination to worry as part of who we are as humans. Now, for instance, that's been really good in the past because if there was a lion looking right at us, you would want to be worried. You'd want to be anxious. You'd have all this like cortisol and stress running through your body and that's so you could run away but you can't do anything about this one. So you're best off not worrying. Um, second thing you can do is trust in the science. And that's what happened in Chernobyl in that um, the scientists basically said, you need to get everybody as far away from this as possible. And you need to take all of this radioactive material and clean it up. And so people did that. And so in this current situation where we're at now, I think the best thing we can do is trust the science because that is how we solve problems these days. Uh, and finally, you can take a breath, stop, relax, think about what is most important to you. What do you care about? That's what I did when my sailboat sank and I had some great revelations. And from that, you can make a goal and move towards it. And we know from a psychological standpoint that that is extremely helpful for people. And I'm hoping that you pick a goal that is reconnecting you to nature. And so I'm going to give you a couple of ways that you can actually do that. Um, the first thing that you can do is find a sit spot. Basically a place you sit down every day and observe wildlife. Maybe you are starting to learn about your local squirrel or bird. You can see the plants bloom and then come back in the winter time. But it's just good to see the daily rhythms of life. You can do that inside looking out the window on your porch. Go find a stump somewhere, maybe a park. Wherever you are, try to find a little piece of nature. And then, boys, come up here. You can help me with this. Then one of the things that you can do is help uh, or try to identify one plant in your yard. So we actually did that uh, recently. This is a little plant that we found in the yard. Can you tell me what that is, Leo? Clover. Four-leaf four clover. And we found a four-leafed one. So fun tidbit, if you find clover, one out of 10,000 of them on average will have four leaves. And then you'll see clover all over the place once you do that. And so. also you can we see, see we tried looking a bacteria. <laughs> 
<laughs> okay, thanks, boys. You can go sit down again. The last thing you can do, which is kind of starting into the animals, learn a bird. Learn what the song is. Try to identify it. And then after that, you'll be on your way. You won't be able to stop. You'll be looking at mushrooms and at uh, mammals, and it'll just keep going on and on. Okay, so that's basically what I have. Uh, I hope that by looking at the past and seeing how things might seem like they're the end of the world, and we, we find out now that they're not, that'll help us as we look towards the future, just to realize it's not the end of the world. And there's a lot of good that can come out of it. We just need to take some time to step back and, and reassess the importance of things. Okay, so now I'm going to get to a couple of questions. We don't have too much time. Um, okay, uh, first question is from Zainab. Zainab asks, is this current pandemic caused by pollution or from some sort of global climate change? Um, and I will quickly say, uh, well, it doesn't help, but, but no, that's not really what this is all caused by. What we could point our finger to, though, is illegal wildlife trade because a lot of viruses live in animals just like they live in us. Um, and we have gotten bad viruses from animals in close contact with them. So HIV came from chimpanzees, Ebola from maybe a bat or some sort of primate in Africa. Um, we had SARS from civets, mares from camels. We had swine flu from pigs, bird flu from birds. And so the closer we get to, the, uh, to animals, especially like if you hold them in captivity and then you eat them, then the more likely we are to have uh, another outbreak like this happen. So we could we should stop illegal wildlife trade right away. And uh, hopefully a lot of people will jump on board that after this. Okay, um, let's see. Uh, a, tri a question from Anna says, tips to become a good science communicator and where to get involved career-wise. Uh, well, I have a science filmmaking channel called Science Filmmaking Tips and Tricks. <laughs> you can look that up on YouTube. Definitely check that out. That's a good way to... I also have a book. Where's my book? Uh, I can't find it. It's over there somewhere <laughs> called How to Make Science and Nature Films. You can find it for me. Um, but there's a couple schools that you could go to as well. Montana State University has Science and Natural History Filmmaking one, and there's one in Bristol as well. Email me. I'll help you out. Okay, here's an an another question. Do you think the fungus found at Chernobyl that's eating the radiation could be cultivated for future disasters and help with cleanup process? Um, fungus are amazing. The more you learn about them, the more you realize that they are able to help clean up tons of disasters like oil spills. Uh, uh, let's see, what else are they used for? And we know oil spills uh, and the ones in Chernobyl, which are doing the radiation. Uh, I know a couple of people here locally at Clemson University, which are studying stuff like that. So yeah, you can cultivate stuff like that. The trick is, um, it might be a mass production issue. <laughs> All right, let's get to a couple more. Um, let's see, what do we have? Um, I actually, there, there's a few different questions. I'm having a hard time running through them because it's, it's hard to see on the side of my screen. I wanted to thank everybody for joining us today. This is an Earth Live lesson and they're, we're having these every single day. So hopefully you can tune in all the time, especially if you're at home during this current pandemic and you have nothing else to do. They're great for kids, great for learning. You always learn something new because there's a hundred different of the most amazing wildlife presenters on the planet that Lizzie has gotten together for her channel. So big thanks to Lizzie. Really appreciate it. Oh, fantastic. There's the book right there. Only one I know of of its kind. <laughs> By the way, if you want to follow what I'm doing, I have a uh, YouTube channel called Stone Age Man, trying to reconnect back with what we were before all of this technology came about. Basically, all of the understanding we had of wildlife and nature and, and how our bodies worked. And, um, and then I'm also on social platforms at Untamed Science, so you can check me out. Thanks, everybody, for watching. I'm seeing some of the comments coming in. This is fantastic. Uh, do you guys want to say goodbye one last time over here? Real, come over here real quick. We're saying goodbye to everybody. Um, make sure you're tuning in with Lizzie's stuff. That's super fantastic. Yes, last comment. Um, I haven't, I didn't know that, I thought Chernobyl was a place before this. It is a place and it, what people are referring to as an event. It's the name of the power plant and the town. Yeah. So, oh, so it's both. Yeah, it is. Fantastic. All right, Just thank you everyone. We'll see you in the future. I'm Stay healthy. Stay positive. I'm sitting on a chair. Yay. Bye. 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 Ah.